So our next speaker is Adrian Belts. She's an associate professor here at the University of Michigan in the Department of Psychology. Um, we began working with Adrian four or five years ago. She now has an R01 grant with Chelsea Kaplan to mine the ABCD study. It's a big um, longitudinal study um, in children. Uh, and we originally reached out to Adrian for her expertise in studying puberty and sex as a biological variable. It turns out that Adrian also has considerable methodologic expertise. I don't know if you're gonna talk at all about some of the gimme methods, but again, some other me uh, research methods that we're now applying to other types of data. So, Adrian? Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, that sounds good, okay. Uh, thanks, everybody, for sticking it out to the end of the day today. Um, appreciate the opportunity to, to be here, so thank you for the invitation. Um, really interested in all the important and intense talks we've had so far today, and on that note, I figured we'd end lightly with a methodological discussion of the benign topic of sex and gender. Um, so, so thanks for having me again. Like Dan said, um, I'm a psychologist and a developmental psychologist. And I'm really interested in gendered psychopathology, in gendered cognition, really all things gendered. And that's how I uh, um, intersect with Chelsea in looking at sex and gender differences in, in relation to pain. So on a truly um, maybe fun note, let's start with a little game. How about guess the year? I'm gonna give you some blurbs and see if you can figure out what year I'm referring to here. Uh, Nelson Mandela won the Nobel Peace Prize. The Blue Jays won the Major League Baseball World Series. Let's take it to Philly. Boys to Men won a Grammy for End of the Road. I'm hearing 90s. Okay, now I'm really gonna give it away. U.S. Congress passed the National Institutes of Health Revitalization Act. Now you got it, right? Yeah? <laughs> 1993. 1993 is the year. And the NIH Revitalization Act um, is an important one. It's the one that actually required that women and NIH-designated uh, minorities were included in clinical trials. Up until that point in time, and we can take... Um, uh, Zolpidem, which is the, the active ingredient in, in a lot of sleep medications like Ambien, um, women hadn't been included in those medical trials or those clinical trials, and they were prescribed doses as based on body weight and size as if they were small versions of men. Uh, turns out women also metabolize this particular drug more slowly, and so the drug stayed in their system longer. They were waking up for work, getting behind the wheel of a car, getting in increased accidents. Um, so it's for reasons like this that... Um, the, the 1993 act came about. Then if we move along, fast forward, like it looks a little 90s theme, right? Um, to 2016, we now have the National Institutes of Health Policy on sex as a biological variable. So this basically extends the 1993 policy to preclinical research as well, to consider female sex in, in preclinical models and in, including cell models. This was also really needed. Um, here's some evidence from Annalise Beery and, and Zucker. They reviewed a set of articles Articles published in 2009 um, on the inclusion of female humans and animals. And you'll see here on the bottom, this has to do with some of the journals they reviewed uh, that focus on human research. Uh, you'll see here this black line um, considers both sexes being included in, in the research studies. And right around 1993, we see this increase in the rate of both sexes being included in the research. But on that same time, up here are some animal-only journals, or primarily journals, and you'll see often sex wasn't reported until about the 80s, and then we see a use of um, primarily male animals in, in research. So this was highly needed, but the, the goals of sex as a biological variable, and this is from uh, the National Institutes of Health Office on, on Women's Health, um, it's not just about including female animals and humans in research, but it's really considering sex at all stages of the research process, right? From, from study design, of course, data collection, data analysis, and then into how we interpret and, and we communicate our results. 
So after sex as a biological variable came out, um, Beery and new colleagues followed up their previous uh, review with a meta-analysis of studies published in 2019, so a decade later, and they did find substantial increases in the number of studies that included male and female subjects. But interestingly, a decrease in the proportion of studies that actually analyzed the data by sex. Um, so much so, I think they said 42% of the studies they reviewed that included both sexes, only 42% actually analyzed the data by sex. And that was a decrease from 2009 when about 50% did so. And this, this emphasis or this need for, for research in, in including female subjects is really exacerbated by some funding priorities. So here I'm gonna show some results of analyses um, conducted by mathematician um, Arthur Muir, and he actually came out of a retirement to do these analyses after his daughter was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and he was struggling to find information on the topic and, and delved into this a bit. So here, um, uh, in graphics uh, uh, made by Carrie Smith, you can see sex-related diseases. So if they're in red, um, they're, they show a, a female dominance and in blue, a male dominance. And you see some here, like this is substance abuse. Um, here's chronic fatigue. And we have um, migraines over here as well. So this is as they are ranked by burden, burden determined by um, uh, death and disability. But if you re-rank those diseases by NIH funding priorities, this is, this is how they fall. And you'll see a lot of the female dominant conditions are on, are on the, the lower funding end. This isn't just uh, uh, an issue in, in the US. There's similar arguments, similar data available from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And here I show uh, what have been come to call the Sager guidelines on sex and gender equity and research. Um, these were motivated within Europe. And these guidelines were mainly published uh, to, to guide authors in how to report sex and gender related information in their manuscripts, but also as a nudge to editorials and the gatekeepers of our science for, for thinking critically about how we, how we include sex and gender related variables in our work. So um, perhaps I've convinced you a bit about the, the need for research. We, we have been including male and female subjects in uh, research participation, not really analyzing data by sex though, and some of this is exacerbated by our funding priorities. So in the same spirit as some of the talks we've heard earlier, let's, let's start with some definitions and make sure we're, we're all thinking about the same thing. So why sex? Um, sex is a set of biological actions. Attributes. It's not just one thing. A set of biological attributes includes genes, transcription factors, hormones, receptor availability, presence, density, uh, multiple aspects of physiology, in, in, including reproductive anatomy and function. And often sex is described as male, female, this kind of binary grouping, but it's really more of a dimension a dimension that hopefully our work can pull out. So really we can look at or consider sex as, as a marker of processes important for a behavior or a physical health condition in which we see disparities. And that helps us narrow in on some of the genetic, hormonal, physiological factors that might matter as long as we acknowledge the continuum on, on which they exist. And so that's what I said, really, the study of sex differences is this investigation of biological contributors to, to sex disparities. And sex disparities exist in pain. Um, we've heard about this throughout our conversations already today. It's been written about, including by folks in this room. Um, sorry, tracking this. There we go. Um, so again, all of the bubbles in red are places where we see a female preponderance, all the bubbles in blue, places where we see a male preponderance, but we don't only see these sex disparities in diagnostic rates, but also in the nature of symptoms, in the prognosis, in treatment profiles. So really we see um, uh, different sets of ways or different um, ways in which sex can influence the, the outcomes that we're studying. 
And so that brings us to a conversation about types of sex differences. And my colleague, um, Jill Becker, has actually delineated this well. If we really want to understand sex and move beyond this binary and consider all of the diverse ways and continuum and, and ways through which these sex-related variables can, can influence pain, we should think about different types of sex differences. Um, we've already talked about the population dif differences, where you see a, a different diagnostic rate in one group than another. I'd say quantitative sex differences are probably the ways in which we most often think about sex differences, or at least analyze our data. Uh, quantitative sex differences are when we really are talking about the same behavior, the same phenotype, the same experience, but it just differs in extent or magnitude in, in males and females. And so you can see this overlap, or this would be kind of the classic overlapping distribution um, argument. There's also qualitative sex differences. So these are um, sex differences when a behavior seen in males and seen in females is kind of like apple and oranges. Um, uh, a common example of this in rodents is just uh, sexual behavior, where the female prototype is lordosis, and in the males you'll see some mounting behavior. Um, I see a lot of this in my own work with puberty, as, as Dan mentioned earlier, where we have different biological processes, different hormone profiles, um, leading to different experiences in, in males and females. Another one we think about a lot are mechanistic or latent sex differences. This is, as a developmental uh, psychologist, what I would call a multifinality, basically different pathways to the same endpoint. So this might be a different function, as you see here, X leads to Y for, for males, but Z leads to Y for females. Um, so we end up with the same sets of behaviors, but for different reasons or through different underlying processes. And importantly, of course, these things aren't mutually exclusive. Um, you can have quantitative contributors, uh, quantitative sex differences that contribute to a population sex difference, for instance. And so a couple of years ago, then, I worked with um, Annalise Speary and Jill Becker to try to figure out, this was shortly after uh, sex as a biological variable came out, and folks were making arguments about whether, well, now we have to include a lot of female animals or subjects into, into our research. This is going to cost more money. How do we even analyze these data? And we said, no problem. It's really easy, right? We've got a schematic for that. And um, so this is what we spent a lot of time putting together and how hopefully you can map or see how we're trying to map some of our thought processes about what types of sex differences you're seeing, qualitative, quantitative, latent, what, what do you expect in terms, of your, in terms of your research question, and how would that map onto your analytic profile like we see here. Um, so if you're expecting sex differences, yes, or you have some literature to guide you, again, what most folks do in an area of work is they look at the, a quantitative difference. That's where you would just include sex as a variable of interest in your analyses, hopefully look at interactions, um, and then describe the effects you see. But when you expect qualitative sex differences or sex differences in different mechanisms or, or population level effects, it might not be reasonable to include males and females in the same analysis. Including males and females in, in separate analyses, conducting analyses by sex separately, is really the best way to understand those sex-specific mechanisms. I think this aligns with some of the talks we heard earlier um, regarding race, race and ethnicity in doing within-group analyses to understand those unique processes as they are in those groups. If you're not sure about sex differences, um, you should still think about them. And you can do your assumption checks, for instance, by sex, visualize your data, consider the different types of sex differences. And if you have power to detect effects, often when we're studying, say, population sex differences, and you might be studying a condition that um, um, mainly occurs in males or mainly occurs in females, and then you go to analyze your data by sex, you're underpowered to detect effects. In, in one of the sexes. And so you might go through and say, nope, I don't have any significant sex differences, when perhaps you didn't even have a real chance of finding them. 
Um, so in these cases, uh, consider power, and it might ultimately be reasonable then to include sex as a variable in your analysis, or perhaps not, but then please report the considerations that you did to inspire the next line of research when folks are trying to figure out how they might include um, sex in their analyses. And when you're doing these types of analyses, please be careful about statistically controlling for sex, right? Statistically controlling for sex, um, again, just like we talked about uh, earlier with some of the uh, data on race and ethnicity, it takes a very rich construct that maps multiple biological factors that, exists on, that exist on multiple continua into often a binary zero one variable. And then we put that into our analyses and it's really perhaps not reasonable to expect that, that we're actually considering um, um, sex variation. And even, even if we do that, um, sex and sex related factors are so influential in so many of the things that we study that the sex variable probably correlates with many of the other variables that are being controlled for in an analysis. Um, for instance, I, again, I work with puberty and there's sex differences in pubertal timing. So whenever sex and puberty are controlled in an analysis, I probably have a statistical issue of residual confounding or suppression. Um, moreover, who are we generalizing our results to in this case? Is it whatever our reference group was? Is it um, um, a group of all sexes? Is, is it a group of people who are sexless? So what do we think we're doing when we're taking that variation out of our analyses? It might be appropriate to do, but think carefully about it kind of in the context of, of sex as a biological variable. Um, to try to illustrate some of these points, I'll share with you a study um, that I did a couple years ago on whether they're investigating whether there's sex differences in the relationship between pubertal timing and adult depression. So there's a lot of work suggesting that early pubertal timing, especially in girls, confers risk for depression and other mental health symptoms in adolescence. Um, but it's less clear about whether those affect or, or how those effects persist into adulthood. And so that's what we investigated and had a cross-sectional survey of over 300 folks aged 18 to 32, so after puberty had occurred. And then we did, I did regression analyses and some uh, mediation tests to try to explore what mechanisms might underlie a relationship between pubertal timing and adult depression. And I usually hate when people show regression slides, but I'm gonna show you a table of regression results here to, to point out that here in these analyses, had I stopped here at stage two or step two, this would be equivalent, right, to controlling for sex and looking for a linear effect of timing. So increases in timing or constant decreases in timing matter for depressive symptoms versus a quadratic effect, which are really popular in pubertal research where say anything off time, basically early or late timing, confer the greatest risk. And in this case, like I said, it would be as if we were controlling for sex. Males were coded zero here, so we'd say, oh, we have this significant sex effect, and that means depressive symptoms were higher in females. Okay, that would be what we would expect. And uh, um, we had an effect there for quadratic pubertal timing, so those with early and uh, late puberty showed more depressive symptoms. But if we continue on and use sex as an interaction with linear and quadratic pubertal timing, we actually see that it was a hidden, um, if you will, uh, interaction effect uh, such that only girls showed this quadratic effect and it was actually a linear effect in boys. And here are those data. Um, I'm just plotting the raw data so you can get a sense of what they look like. In this case, you can see we'd have a, a qualitative uh, sex difference or a, um, a latent sex difference here that the function explaining the relationship between pubertal timing and depressive symptoms, it was a quadratic relationship for females. It was a linear relationship for males. Um, and we also found that different mechanisms underlie that relationship. For females, we found that negative affect was this indirect effect. So early and late pubertal timing, uh, women with early or late pubertal timing reported more depressive symptoms as, uh, as adults, and negative affect explained that relationship. 
But very interestingly, in males, we found that those with later pubertal timing reported more depressive symptoms as results, and self-perceptions of masculinity actually explain some of this. And this actually also um, is consistent with other reports that have come out where body mass index in males, lower body mass index have been, has been found to um, um, explain a, a similar effect. I'm gonna say more about that in a minute. So some interim conclusions. Consider sex um, and the biological factors that you think sex is marking um, when, when conducting a particular analysis. Consider the nature of the sex differences, moving beyond just comparing scores on some linear trajectory, but think about mechanisms, think about whether the process makes sense to examine within a group. Um, Design a study and analyze your data with those mechanisms in mind. And please remember, especially in humans, that uh, biology is not destiny, right? Hair color genetically uh, determined, but a trip to my environmental salon can change that pretty quickly. So just because we might detect a biological factor contributing to some outcome doesn't mean that it's determined or, or that it's not a point of intervention. Um, again, like we've heard a lot about today. Moreover, and as we've also heard about today, gender matters a great deal, right? Gender is a set of socially constructed factors. Um, this goes from roles and norms within a society, power relationships that exist. Identity is one part of gender um, that we, we heard about earlier. And I'd also like to emphasize that with the socially constructed nature of gender, this means that gender varies based across time. The, the times and the cultures in which, in which we exist influence how we think about gender, the words we have to describe gender. And um, in a lot of work, especially with humans, we really can't separate, in some cases, the multi-determined nature of the outcomes we're examining. And this is where I'll return to that uh, link between pubertal timing and depressive symptoms in boys, right? This sex-related factor of pubertal timing, um, the experience of puberty and development, that mattered, but so did the gender-related context in which that timing exist, existed, um, because the self-perceptions of masculinity are probably the reason why, or at least one reason why, pubertal timing experiences in adolescence um, continued to have significance into adulthood for some individuals. And so given the richness of gender, given the richness of um, sex, uh, really our goal has to be to study these things in concert in individuals. Um, and to further highlight how sex and gender variation is important, um, this is one of my uh, favorite slides, but consider we're doing a quantity, we're gonna look at a quantitative sex difference even, right? The, the simplest of the types of sex differences. And we have a distribution for females in red and for males in blue. And we say, here's the mean for females, here's the mean for males, I have a sex difference. But even in that case, we have a whole bunch of males who score above the average for females, a whole bunch of females who score below the average for males. And so some way we have to move our integrated sex and, and gender related sciences more toward precision medicine. So a lot of what I showed you, including in the earlier puberty study, we were looking at inter-individual variation, right? Variation between people, say maybe of the same sex. Um, and what we don't think a lot about in our analyses, but is yet assumed, is that studies or examinations of between person variation assume homogeneity in time and across people. They have to, in order to generalize to other members of that population who weren't included in the sample. But often, especially for these complex, richly integrated concepts of sex and gender, we can't make these assumptions. And instead, we're better off moving to studies of intra-individual variation, where we focus within a person, many, many time points within a person. This is where time series data come in. Um, and this type of analysis really capitalizes on heterogeneity because it allows us to see how one person varies from their own mean or their own set of experiences without having to compare them to other people. And so one type of time series data are functional magnetic resonance imaging data. If you really think about it, every two or three seconds, right, the scanner gets a picture of what's going on in the brain. 
And so I'll close here by giving you an example of some person-specific analyses kind of stratified or, or held within a, a sex differences study. So along with Esmeralda Hidalgo Lopez and Chelsea Kaplan, uh, Tristan Smith, several other folks here, we're interested in investigating whether there's sex differences in the heterogeneous neural underpinnings of multi-site pains and, and how it's linked to behavior. So here I'm talking about sex differences in neural underpinnings. That sounds like a, a latent or a mechanistic sex difference, right? So we're gonna do analyses here that are stratified by sex. We're gonna consider males and females separately, but we also think these processes are very individualized. And so we'll do person-specific analyses with those functional imaging data that we have. So we use ABCD study data to do this, and as Dan mentioned earlier, this is a large longitudinal uh, study within the United States um, from 21 different sites uh, across the country. We had over 1,000 males, over 1,000 females. Um, they were matched on pubertal status, race, ethnicity, and handedness. And uh, what were matched were our three groups. We had a no-pain group, a regional pain group, and a multi-site pain group. Multi-site pain was um, defined as three or more points of pain on, on the body map. And then we conducted person-specific analyses of their fMRI data during resting state, and then we looked in sex stratified analyses whether particular metrics or features of those individualized neural networks um, mattered for problems often comorbid with multi-site pain, things like attention problems and sleep disturbances. And so here's the uh, three brain regions or three brain networks we looked at, I'm sorry. Um, you can see they're color coded there, the salience network in green, default mode in yellow. And I'd like you to focus on the somatosensory and motor networks there in blue. Those were the regions that we used to define each of the networks. And then we used a, um, an algorithm um, called group iterative multiple model estimation, which basically fits a type of structurally vector equation model to each person in a data set by leveraging some information and prioritizing what's common across groups or subgroups. Um, and here we, we subgrouped according to sex. So here's just three illustrative maps. We have a map like this for all 2,000 some people in our, um, in our sample. And these blue regions down here, these are the somatosensory regions. And we calculated a metric of density, basically saying how many connections go to and from those particular regions that gives us some index of how important um, that particular somatosensory network is for, um, for explaining uh, these group differences and potentially links to behavior. And when we did that, um, we found that both males, you'll see here, and females with multi-site pain, the multi-site pain group is like the darkest yellow group here, they had reduced connectivity, so they had reduced density, fewer of those connections um, in the um, sensory motor network, um, but only for females did this particular connectivity explain relationships between multi-site pain and sleep disturbances. So females with multi-site pain had greater sleep disturbances and um, their connectivity within the sensory motor network explained that link, but that wasn't the case um, for males. We were highly powered to detect it. It wasn't even close. Um, so my updated conclusions then are that sex and gender variation, they matter for a lot of behaviors, including uh, chronic pain, uh, pain, and we need to accurately consider the interplay of sex and gender related factors with a focus on individuals. We can use time series, we can use personalized analyses to, to help us get there. I showed you results from our um, upcoming uh, uh, paper on on um, multi-site pain in kids. And what we found was some similarities between male and female adolescents in the neural networks underlying multi-site pain. But we also found um, some qualitative differences, some differences in the mechanisms underlying that relationship uh, such that um, we only had a mediating effect of brain connectivity on sleep disturbances for females. And um, lastly, this approach 
can help clarify, I think, mechanisms lying all individuals in unique experiences of pain. If, if sex differences is just a starting point, is just a way to identify some types of factors that are likely to matter, they then lead us down a research track that help us identify the specific sex-related factors that matter. Once we know a set of factors, we can see how they play out in the lives of unique individuals if, if we conduct some personalized analyses. So thanks to my collaborators, funding, and if there's time, I'm happy to take some questions.